So now it's the time for us to sit in meditation. And we do so by placing our uh, right leg over our left and our right hand on our left palm, setting our body up straight in an upright posture. And we put our mindfulness to the fore. Try not to think about any issues, anything. Um, whether it's to do with the economy, whether it's to do with illnesses, sicknesses, anything that's gone already that's passed, or any worries we may have over the future, we try and put all of that down now. And why is that? Because any thoughts that we may have about these things, they're not able to help us in any way. But what we need to do is to um, have mindfulness here in the present moment. Even though practicing with mindfulness and samadhi, developing uh, this collectedness and firmness of heart is difficult, um, if we put in the effort and we persist, then it's something that we all can succeed in. However, we need to depend and rely upon forbearance and endurance. And even though there might be much difficulty and um, arduous here in the present, um, what results from that is the growth and manifestation of wisdom and knowledge, which then leads on to freedom and this inner freedom that comes up within our own hearts. It's natural for the mind that is deluded by a sense of self that still believes in a true self um, that will be attached to these things. And it's been this way for many lives now. We've taken birth. We've had a self that's um, come into the world and um, there's been becoming and birth many, many times. But what's meant by this is that even within this life, there's been many births and birth that happens within our own hearts. And whenever a self arises in the mind, then suffering arises along with it. So now we come to train ourselves, to train our minds. And even though we have a self there, we are using it in a good way, in a skillful way. We're developing the self and using it to build a house that can be a shelter for our hearts. The Buddha taught us that we need to put an effort in this practice. And through that effort, then we'll meet with um, happiness, the happiness that comes from freedom. The Buddha taught us that we should uh, find joy and be content with seclusion and quiet places. So for monks, we stay in our hut by ourselves. And the reason we do that is to give us the opportunity to um, practice quietly. And even though we've come together now for this chanting and meditation, or maybe those who are listening in at home are by yourselves. Um, still, it's very quiet. We've come together in a peaceful way and come to train ourselves in mindfulness and keeping our minds here, grounded in the present moment. Training ourselves to put down all our thoughts and all our issues. So when wisdom arises in the heart, then it will be easy for understanding in the Dhamma to come up. It won't be something difficult at all. And the, this is because the nature of the Dhamma is that it's always open. It's always revealed. It's anicca, dukkha, anatta, of inconstancy, stress or suffering and not self. It's something that's 
open and clear. It's, it's opened up already. And the Buddha came to meet with these truths and understand them. And that's what allowed him to attain to the Dhamma. And then he then taught this path that we can attain to the Dhamma as well, this very path of Sila Samadhi Panya. So Sila, morality, is the collectedness and the restraint of our body and speech. When we're skilled at that, then um, it won't be too difficult to develop mindfulness and samadhi. And the samadhi that's based upon sila is complete and uh, perfect. From that, the heart will gain peace. And it'll happen a little at a time. Slowly, the mind will um, become still and it will gather together onto one object. And this is what we mean when we say the uh, samadhi or the jhana factors of vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekakada. The meaning is to have mindfulness on one single object of meditation until the mind settles down and becomes peaceful. So it's just like the pendulum of a clock. Um, If it's constantly swinging back and forth, then it won't ever reach stillness. But if we can stop that swinging, then it will become still. It will reach a state of peace. And so it's the same with our minds. If we can um, stop them from going thinking about this and that, but rather keep them on one object, then they'll calm down into peace. And from that um, steady place, we can then look out at the world. And whether we look at a glass, we look at a meditation hall, um, we can see that these things are just conventions, they're suppositions. These names are things that we've all supposed up. So like you say in English, a cup, or in Thai, a gal. Um, These are just suppositions of language. Maybe we say that um, it's big or it's small, that it has this color or it's uh, um, of this nature. We can describe it in many different ways. But really, this is just the proliferation of the mind. If our minds don't go and proliferate in this manner, then we'll see into the true nature of all of these things. And by seeing that true nature, we'll perceive the Dhamma. We'll realize the arising and ceasing of these things. Seeing the Dhamma and realizing, uh, attaining vimuti, liberation in the heart. When we come to this point for the first time, then the heart will overflow with joy. And, um, And that's because we've just seen it for the first time, even though it's always been that way, it's always been like that. Um, We've never seen it before. And so for myself, when I was a lay person practicing, keeping the five precepts and the eight precepts, whenever I listened to the Dharma, I would contemplate along as well. And so there was one time I listened to a teaching by Ajahn Chah, and he was teaching about the nature of Samuti and Vimuti, of supposition and liberation. He was saying that um, a glass is just a convention that we've come up with. And really that glass isn't big and it's not small. But if we put another glass next to it of a different size, then automatically the heart starts to compare. It starts to proliferate. And then this convention of big and small appears. But really, there's no big, there's no small there. There's no being, there's no self. It's all just convention. So if we take that back into our own bodies, we can look at our breath and see or ask ourselves, well, this breath, does it have a name? Does it claim to be a breath? Is there any self in there? 
my breath and the breath of all of the beings and the animals in this world, there's no name, there's no self. It's the same with the liquids in this body, the water. Does it ever claim to have a name, to have a label? Or what about the earth element, the solidity? Does that ever claim to have a name? It doesn't. And the heat, the fire element in this body, it's the same whether it's this fire element or the fire element in the bodies of other beings. And it never claims to be a fire element. If the mind is still and peaceful, then it'll get beyond these conventions and see um, just the four elements there. There's no being, there's no self, there's no me, there's no other. Emptiness then arises through this perceiving into the nature of not-self. Wisdom manifests along with knowledge. And when we see this, um, then we've seen into the Dhamma. And by seeing into the Dhamma, we destroy our wrong views and give rise to right views. Vimuti then um, comes up. We, the heart is liberated and it travels above the world. It goes beyond the world, Lokutara. So it's possible for wisdom to arise at this very moment that we're listening to the Dhamma, just as what happened to Venerable Anya Kondanya. He saw into the Dhamma for the first time, and he saw into this nature of arising, lasting, and ceasing. It's something that all of us are able to do whether we're males, we're females, we're young or old, if we follow this path of sila samadhi panya and it all collects together into one entity, then we'll see the truth. But if we haven't attained to any high or liberating stage of Dhamma, then this is something we should reflect upon. Reflect that we haven't got there yet, and we should renew our efforts to try to obtain such a state. You put in our efforts into mindfulness and into um, samadhi, into the collecting and restraining of our body and speech within the bounds of morality. We then go and, um, oh, sorry, we then see that the nature of these bodies, is that once they've been born, um, they then get old, they get sick, and they die. And that's just what they're like. That's simply their nature. If we bring up mindfulness, and we recollect this object of contemplation frequently, um, then we won't be heedless in our lives. And why is that? It's because that's just the nature of this life and of this body. If we're deluded, then um, we won't want to experience old age, sickness and death. And when we're young, that may be okay, but it starts getting very problematic when we get older. Because even though we don't want to get these things, we'll get them. The things that we don't want, we'll experience that. And the things that we do want, health and vigor, we won't be able to uh, receive that. So we contemplate that that's just the nature of having been born into this world, is that we experience old age, sickness and death. And this is the inheritance we gain when we're born. It's very common these days for people to want to get inheritance, to get a lot of wealth, and they think that that'll make them very happy. But this inheritance that we gain from our bodies, we all gain it. And it's something that doesn't make us happy when, when it comes to us. So we need to contemplate these things very deeply in our minds. 
um, in a way that allows them to really sink in. So just like when we chant, um, even though we're chanting these verses, it can often not go in very deep. And it's just like using topical medicine. Um, even though we put it, we're applying that medicine, it still isn't able to cure very severe illnesses or those illnesses which are deep within the body. So what we need then is um, oral medicine. We need some pills or we need to get an injection. And that's then able to cure these diseases on a much deeper level. So what that means is that we need vipassana or we need panya to really be able to cure these diseases in order for true understanding to come up. But this all depends on our efforts that we put into the practice. So today is one pra, it's the Lunar Observance Day, the uh, 13th of July. And all of us should really put in our efforts, be sincere in practicing and cultivating our hearts and do this with great sincerity. You should try to gain results from this practice. Because if we're not sincere, then there's no way that we'll be able to see the Dhamma. So we need to have this integrity in our practice as well. So with it being the Lunar Observance Day, there's um, many monks here who will stay up um, the whole night and they'll fight against or struggle against sleepiness, drowsiness uh, throughout this night, giving the heart energy, trying to overcome the hindrances. And for those who uh, their bodies aren't up to it, they don't have the necessary health or energy, then they stay at least until midnight. If we really train ourselves in this way, be sincere and put in effort and energy, um, then uh, we'll be able to um, gain results. If the body is strong, then we should use that strength. And if it's not strong, then stay up until midnight and then wake up at maybe 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And that's enough rest. Um, it's enough for us to um, put in our efforts. So when we have our minds collected and gathered together, then with that very centered and stable heart, we'll see into the nature of convention, samuti, and realize vimuti, liberation. And just like for myself, when I realized this, there was great joy um, that flowed into my heart for many, many days. And the mind was very full of happiness. Seeing that the lives of all beings must meet with old age, sickness, and death, and no one can escape from this. When I perceived into that, there was nothing in this world that I wanted. I didn't want any of its wealth. I didn't want any of it uh, to take any of it as um, my own, as a possession. Because I saw that none of it would last. It all ends. And that the Dhamma is of the greatest value. In the end, all of us have to leave all our possessions behind. Everything that we gain in this world, we have to um, leave. And so what would we want from the world? And on our final day, on our last breaths, what could we possibly wish for from this world? The only thing that's of true worth is seeing and knowing into the Dhamma, is changing our wrong views into right views. This is what is of most importance and what holds the most value. So just like we chant uh, the Buddha Ratana, Dhamma Ratana, Sangha Ratana, the jewel of the Buddha, the jewel of the Dhamma, the jewel of the Sangha, are uh, the most precious and highest things in the three worlds. And so we should all practice until we 
become ourselves, until we give rise to the Sangha Ratana, the jewel of the Sangha in our own hearts, through seeing the Dhamma Ratana and the Buddha Ratana, the jewel of the Dhamma and the Buddha there in our hearts as well. So may all of you have devotion to this practice, be sincere in your efforts throughout this night, whether monks or the lay people. <laughs>